Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to five things to think about regarding practicum, internship and supervision in the time of COVID-19 pandemic. We're gonna wait a minute or two to allow for people to join. Once again, good afternoon, everyone, to the Springer Publishing webinar series. This afternoon, we'll be talking about five things to think about regarding practicum, internship and supervision in the time of COVID-19 pandemic with Drs. Austin. Want to thank all of you for spending part of your afternoon with us. We know how busy and hectic things are right now, graduation and everything else. But thank you so much for spending some time with us. Okay, I think we're going to get started. Once again, my name is Rhonda Dearborn. I'm the Senior Editor for Counseling at Springer Publishing Company. And we're so happy today to have you join us for the Springer Publishing webinar series. Today's topic, once again, is five things to think about regarding practicum, internship, and supervision in the time of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our presenters are Dr. Jude Austin and Dr. Julius Austin. We're so pleased and happy that they're here today to talk to you about this very important topic. Uh, this presentation will be available to you. We'll be sending out an email with this presentation recorded for you in about seven to 10 business days. And we will also have a special offer for you at the end of the presentation. So please stay to the very end. I would like to tell you a little bit about our presenters. Drs. Jude and Julius Austin were born and raised in Louisiana. They played soccer collegiately, professionally, and in the US Olympic Developmental Program. They both earned undergraduate and graduate degrees from the University of Mary Hardin Baylor in psychology exercise sports science, and clinical mental health counseling. They went on to receive doctoral degrees in counselor education and supervision from the University of Wyoming. Dr. Jude Austin is a licensed professional counselor, licensed marriage and family therapy associate, nationally certified counselor, and a certified clinical mental health counselor. He is currently an assistant professor in the professional counseling program at the University of Mary Hardin Baylor and serves as the program's clinical coordinator. Dr. Julius Austin has a PhD in counselor education and supervision. He is a licensed professional counselor and a nationally certified counselor. He is currently a clinical therapist and the coordinator for the Office of Substance Abuse and Recovery at Tulane University. He is also an adjunct professor at Southeastern Louisiana University and Southern University and a and College. Doctors Austin are both in private practice in their respective cities. In addition to publishing the Counselor Educator's Guide, Practical In-Class Strategies and Activities published by Springer Publishing Company, which we'll be talking a bit about later, they have co-authored the books Counselor Self-Care and Surviving and Thriving in Your Counseling Program, both published by the American Counseling Association. They both enjoy spending time with their families, chasing their kids, doing CrossFit, playing golf, and watching Arsenal Football Club. And with that, before we, I turn it over to Dr. Austin, we are taking questions. We will be doing Q&A at the end of the presentation. So if anything pops up that you'd like to ask our presenters about, please note at the bottom of your screen, if you hover over with your mouse, uh, there's a Q&A box. You'll want to enter questions in that box and we will be taking questions and answering them at the conclusion of today's presentation. And with that being said, I'm so happy to turn the presentation over to Dr. Austin. Wow, thank you so much for the introduction. And I think I wanna um, start by saying thank you to everybody who came. I know um, I echo um, Julia's thoughts in that. Thank you to uh, Rhonda and Lee and everybody from the Springer Publishing Company um, for supporting us and our ideals for writing this book. Um, speaking of the book, a lot of the things we're going to talk about today are going to come from uh, that book. A lot of the ideals that we're presenting are coming from, uh, from that book um, because we wrote it for supervisors and counselor educators. Um, and, and so with, with that in mind, I think we can start with uh, the agenda to talk about some of the things we want to talk about today. Uh, we got about five things we want to we want to talk about, five overall topics, um, situational awareness, being informed, flexibility, uh, technological savviness, and then 
uh, talk about self-care. Um, and within those um, those topics, we have a couple of different bullet points um, that we're going to address. Um, and I'm going to take some of those um, those points, and then Jews are going to take some of those points. And so it's just going to be a back and forth uh, kind of conversation. And so let's move on to the first one. Uh, the first one, the first one of those points is um, situational awareness. You know, we got three things we want to share, right? And these are, are our ideals um, to kind of things that you should be mindful of when you're supervising students. Um, so the first one is gaining a perspective, right? In this situation, at this time, we think one of the most important things uh, for us to do is to be able to to step back and gain a perspective. And, and one of the things we noticed was uh, for our students and for our supervisees, the hours, right? The hours with loved ones are way more important than the clinical hours, right? And we just have to kind of be mindful of that uh, after working with students that, you know, while the clinical hours are important to you, and some of these students and some of these supervisees, they care more, more way more about spending time with uh, grandma or grandpa or their mom or their dad or their kids. And so we have to reassess uh, our priorities in the supervision dynamic. Also, I think, you know, it's important to understand that there's a common enemy here, you know. So um, for a lot of uh, relationships, especially in the supervisory relationship, there's anxiety, there's frustration, there's confusion. There's a lot of things that uh, there's a lot of common commonalities that, that occur within the relationship. So it's important to, to give voice and, and respect that. Um, also focus on doing what is best for everyone. So, I mean, it's essentially, you know, what, what at least I try to do, and I, I can echo that for Jude is try to understand firstly, like what's, what's, best for me in this situation? What, what do I actually need? What fits well for me? Right? And then check in with students and supervisees. And so moving on to the, to the next point, right? Um, in this having situational awareness is man, being aware of your supervisees, knowing those supervisees, right? Focus on, on all the supervisees, not just the ones that are struggling, right? Whether you're supervising in practicum, internship, or postgraduate. Right, you got to know their clinical struggles. Right, what did, did they struggle with basic counseling skills? Do they struggle mm -hmm. with more advanced counseling skills? You got to know what they're struggling with, and then in addition to the clinical work, you also got to know their emotional and physical struggles. Right, at this time, because you know, like pressure tells the truth. You know, and so it's it's when they're feeling that pressure, and they're not getting hours, and you're feeling everybody's feeling that pressure. They're going to be struggling emotionally and physically, and those things that that they may be able to deal with, they they can't deal with at this time. So if I can if I can jump in, I mean to kind of piggyback off of what you're saying, you 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 have to know the students academically as well. So I mean from from our perspective, that doesn't mean you know whether the student is an A B an A student or a B student, but but really taking into account how the student, or at least how you know the student to essentially learn. You know, so take into account, you know, is the student thrive in more structured environments or do they thrive in more, you know, loose environments where there's hardly any structure, you know, and, and what type of anxiety or issues that may create throughout the supervisory process. And then respect those struggles. You know, it's, it's important to not only know it, but respect that the student is struggling specifically in their own unique way, you know, and try to help the student to at least you know, humanize that experience. Hmm. And then the last point in this kind of overall topic of having situational awareness is um, managing your blurred roles now, mm -hmm. right? Having, having that situation awareness of how the roles are going to change because as supervisors, man, you're wearing so many different hats. You're like a supervisor, a mentor, therapist, educator, mom, dad, uncle, I mean, you just, you're wearing so many different hats in that supervisory relationship, right? And so you got to be kind of mindful of how those roles are going to going to blur and change because they're going to become more fluid, right? There's going to be, where right, maybe there was a little bit more compartmentalization between supervision, mentorship, and therapists and, and, and before COVID-19. Now those roles shift and fluid like a little bit more seamlessly. 
into to you know the seamless roles sometimes be become a little blurred in the sense that you know it's not just the typical roles that we find ourselves in at least from my experience and the experience of of Jude and some of our colleagues there needs to be some adjustment in availability not necessarily from a scheduling perspective but but more so from you know are you are you mentally physically uh, you know, capable of being available to a student or a supervisee as their supervisor? Can you switch between roles in the middle of a session, you know, between being a quasi-therapist and an educator or a consultant or sometimes being a gatekeeper? So there, there needs to be some, some you know, uh, some availability, especially with the way that you're adjusting. Yeah, it's it's like this time is like call for you to maybe redefine the the mm -hmm. concept of availability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so moving on to the next big point, remember we talked about situational awareness first, right? And now we're moving into uh, to a different big point, uh, which is being informed. That's something to be mindful of in this time. Uh, we got six kind of mini topics that we want to talk about in this section, and the first one is. Uh, being an answer source, right? being an answer source for students, um, because right now it's like you may be you, you may be like the constant. You may be the person that they are looking for. And some of the things that that helped us, some of the things that uh, helped me in particular was creating a flow chart like that old school, like bubble chart where one thing leads. <laughs> if you do this, say yes, then go here. If no, then go. I mean, just making it simple because our world, you know, our life is, uh, is going to be uh, hectic too as well. And then triple checking uh, that information, right? Going back and forth and checking and looking and making sure that, um, that the information that you do have is, is correct and the, and the chart that you're following, the process that you're following um, is correct as well. So, so that that's super important, right? To 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 understand the you know the, the flow chart and you know to be very informed, but but then there's also some things that you just don't know, which is it can be very hard for you know me and I'm sure Jude as a faculty member because sometimes for students we're their go-to resource for information, you know. So it's important to get comfortable with you know, the phrase, I don't know, let me get back to you. And the, the most important thing for me in that phrase is the let me get back to you, right? Because there's some action that needs to be taken in that phrase, right? So, so you may not have the correct answer today, um, you know, and so things might shift tomorrow, but uh, given the student the idea that, listen, I'm, I'm here, I'm going to try to figure out the answer for the both of us. And this is going to be a very open and communicative process. Yeah, if you felt like your role as a supervisor before COVID was to know everything, like <laughs> <laughs> that bubble is is popped to the like. As well, that wasn't our role. That wasn't our role. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, and uh, and so to to help with that, that the next point, right? In addition to to know to being an answer source and knowing that you don't have all of the answers, right, is developing a process, right? Developing an iterative process, because right? that, that helped me. Uh, and I know it, it, it helped Julius when he's working with supervisees, mm -hmm. creating that iterative process where you're going back and forth to, supervi to, to supervision, right? Where you're consulting with peers, maybe consulting with your supervisor or your uh, consultant, right? Or your peer group, right? And then going back to supervision and reporting and saying, okay, here's what I, here's what I heard. Here's what I think we're gonna be doing and then repeating that process, right? Just over and over again. So you set up a rhythm with the students, right? So they know like, okay, when I get to supervision, you know, things that I'm confused about, we may lay those things out and process them, right? And then in addition to that, creating a central hub of information for yourself. I know for me, uh, I'm a Dropbox person and me and Julia share many a folder and I can see him uploading things and sharing things and there's just something comforting knowing that, okay, I have somebody else who's also adding to this folder. Um, but it's a central hub when you keep the information so it's not confusing, right? Like, you know, what did this law say and what did KCREP say and, and what did Dr. So-and-so say? Like, just keeping all of that stuff in a central located place. 
in, in the, the last part here, check in with supervisees, it, it sounds very, in a sense, passive, right? So yeah. like, hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing yeah. good. You know, yeah. but, but really, I mean, there's some meaning behind the phrase to check in with supervisees. You know, not necessarily a quick high and by how you're doing, but like really, you know, how are you feeling? What is this process like for you? What is, you know, how does this process influence in our relationship? You know, how are you doing at home? What are you experiencing? Are you tired? Are you are you eating? Did you take yeah. a shower? Did you shower today? <laughs> yeah. Did you brush your teeth? Things like that may seem trivial, but they're really important, especially when you're building the connective tissue within the relationship. Mm-hmm. And then to to add to that point, right? Creating that iterative process, right, also means that you got to be proactive, right? To be informed now is to be proactive and to go and figure out what's going on. Help the students, help the students and the supervisors that you have stay organized because I don't know if you guys are like me, but I'm allergic to paperwork. Like I sneeze when I get around it, it's seasonal, you know? And so, and so when, when I'm messing with students' folders or supervising folders or client notes or treatment plans, it's like, I struggle with that. And so, when you're working with a student or a supervisee, they they are definitely going to struggle with that. You got to be proactive with clinical sites, check in with those sites, call them and say, what's going on? What's happening? You know, like, are, is the student going to be able to continue hours? Is, is my supervisee going to be able to continue hours there? And then organize their folders, right? Like, if, if I open up my, my folder drawer and it usually looks like a dumpster fire or like a grenade went off, like, now is the time to reorganize those folders. Mm-hmm. Because the organization is what's going to help the, the the student and the supervisee and the supervisor just feel so much more comfortable while everything's in flux. And and kind of going back off of what you mentioned, you like you know with this iter- iterative process, it, it's important to also maintain contact with you know sites with with you know supervisee sites. So you know schedule virtual visits. You know, and even if you're in the process of developing new internship sites, like this is really important to to continue that, you know, communicative process and also provide continuing education. You know, it's important to to make sure that, I mean, to understand at least that, you know, some of these supervisees, you know, especially in like my case, I've been with some students for a long time, you know, so to provide, you know, continuing education for the sites that my students are in, helping them help my students is very important at this time. And to, to add on to that, you know, conversation of being pro, being proactive um, and to, to, to knowing that you don't have the answers, sometimes students, they won't even know what they need, mm-hmm. you know, like they won't even know what to ask and even know what questions to ask. Supervisees are going to struggle with this too, even if it's post-graduation. You, know, you think, okay, you got a master's degree, you went through internship, you should know what's going on. This, this is, that's not the case, you know, and so we got to help supervisees stay organized with their hours. Um, we, we, we got to, we got to check in with those sites. We got to um, stay organized with the folders. I mean, it's, we got to do a whole bunch of things to help the students kind of know, okay, this is the questions that you should be asking right now. Okay. In addition to that, um, um, we have to, to check in with local and state laws and policies, right? Um, we have to to make sure that, you know, we're ahead of those things because sometimes that may not be on the first thing on a student's mind, right? Or a supervisee's mind is the state by state guidances and the employment laws and uh, tracking policies. Like they may not understand uh, uh, how to check into those laws or even where to look. So and I think, you know, knowing where to look is important because it, it keeps you abreast of not only the policies from a state and, and, and local um, laws, but, but also, I mean, university policies. I mean, there's questions up in the air. You know, what happens with my, what happens with my, with my hours? You know, what happens with, you know, this class or what happens with, um, with, 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 with these hours or with this experience, you know, so it's important to really understand the policies and be able to express and communicate those policies. Another thing to be informed on 
it, especially if you're a counselor educator, is KCREP's position and uh, accreditation. Because, I mean, students, you know, that's not important to them, right? Like the students are just like, what are my assignments? How do I turn those in? But we have to be aware of that. And, and in general, I mean, the KCREP standards or the KCREP's position is that maintain the standards, right? They're not prohibiting any telehealth or distance supervision or counseling for students. But KCREP really wants uh, counselor educators to provide the best education for students. There's some leeways in that, right? They give you some, some kind of leeway on how you're going to do that and how you're going to serve each student. Um, but they're not wavering on the hours. Like if you're in practicum and internship, you still got to get uh, the same hours, right? And so moving on to the, to the next kind of big topic, right? We've covered uh, situational awareness. We've covered um, being informed. Uh, and so the next big thing we're going to cover is flexibility. And we got four things to think about uh, when it comes to flex flexibility. And the first thing is that nothing is normal. Like that bell-shaped curve of this is how the semester is going to go or this is how supervision is going to go. Like we are like four or five standard deviations away from how things are supposed to be, right? Uh, and so expect the unexpected, right? It's part of that flexibility. I don't know how many times I was in supervision and just this like naked kid walked, ran past in supervision. And it's like, is that your kid? You know, like you have to expect so many different things doing tele-supervision um, that you wouldn't, you wouldn't expect, right? If you were face to face. Um, the same thing with, um, with uh, consistency, right? Um, try, trying to be as consistent as possible. It's not gonna look the same. Right. Just, we just have to kind of accept that supervision is not going to look the same and may not even feel the same as much. But if you can create, keep that consistency, like if the first thing you do is open the folders and check the hours, then that's the first thing you do, even if it's tele uh, supervision. Mm -hmm. And to, to kind of you know, go off of your point, you with consistency, even, you know, having a having some type of consistent meeting time you know, is also important where you know, okay, so next week, this is, this is kind of what next week is going to look like, you know, but, it, you know, moving on to the next point that this is kind of something that I guess I'm experiencing right now. I'm worried about the audio going out in this, you know, in, in this environment. I'm worried about my computer all of a sudden needing to update in this very moment because that's what happens, right? <laughs> Did they so, just re automate a restart? Automate, yeah, you know. So, <laughs> so, so, you know, it's important to to you know be able to adapt on the fly. You know, okay, so the internet is crappy, so you know we're not going to be able to do you know telesupervision, uh, maybe you know via Zoom or, or whatever venue. So maybe it's important to figure out a secondary option like talking on the phone. You know, those those things are important, especially when you're trying to understand, you know, that that supervision looks different now mm -hmm. yeah that flow chart we talked about earlier can come in handy when you're preparing i mean especially for supervisees right so in a, another point in addition to, to nothing being normal right and, and maintaining your flexibility is being human in this time like this is this is the time where we should serve supervisees like we serve like we want them to serve our clients right, their clients, like model for them, right, being appropriately transparent and showing them like, yeah, this is the time like I'm struggling too. And I hope my kid stays asleep. And I hope my audio works out, you know, it's just like, like treating them uh, like human beings who's not perfect, right. Um, because, you know, you, you may be the only person that's non family that they talk to at that time, right. And even though it's supervision, it's still another connection with a human that some people may not have, have had in months or, or weeks, you know? And so it's just important to be mindful of that. Another thing to be mindful of is that, um, you know, it, I've had the, the privilege of, you know, having a wife who also works and, you know, we kind of bounce off each other. So she'll go to work and, and I'll stay home with the kids and then, you know, I'll go to work and she'll stay home with the kids, especially throughout this time. So a lot of supervisees are experiencing very similar um, experiences, you know? So yeah, the only adult that they've spoken to today may be their supervisor, 
you know, and it's, it, it may, it, it's also important to understand that they, it may be the same situation for you, you know, so, so another thing that's important is staying connected when needed, when needed. That, I mean, that can be via email, that can be via phone, I mean, via text message, I mean, any way to stay connected is important because this is a time where, I mean, I'll venture to say everyone, but especially supervisees who are vulnerable, feel isolated within the process. Yeah. And so we've, we've talked about being human. You know, we've talked about maintaining flexibility and that nothing is normal. And I think the hardest thing to do now when, when maintaining your flexibility is, is keeping those standards up, right? Because if you are a counselor educator and you're teaching students in internship and practicum, you know, you got to maintain the KCRIP standards. If you are uh, supervising postgraduates, right, you got to maintain those, those ethical standards as well. And so now you have to maintain the standards and also maintain the flexibility, right? And so this is an opportunity to model for, for supervisees just how to flex and how to handle that stress and how to have that, you know, frustration tolerance, right? Um, especially uh, when it comes to assessments, right? Like, like maintaining the standards with assessments and, and seeing how you rate, you know, students. I know at, at my university, you know, we use the CCS. And it's just a way for us to monitor how students are growing from midterm to final. Those things may change, you know, not the, not the things that you're assessing, but, but what you're looking for, right? Because it's a completely different way of doing therapy now via tele. Reflecting is different. Like, those things are different. Mm -hmm. And just to kind of keep yourself organized as well, I mean, monitor supervisees, supervisees clients' paperwork. I mean, what that does is it, it, it kind of, at least from my experience, it gives you a chance to kind of sit down and look at physical things like paperwork, right? Even if it's not physical and it's electronic, to, to, to get an idea of, all right, so this is the passing of time. This is what this session looked like. And this is how you're staying organized as a clinician. And also it helps to kind of uh, be a review for, for supervisees, especially if they have questions about a client that maybe didn't show up for a while. Those things are really important in maintaining the standards. Mm -hmm. um, and the next thing with flexibility, the next little point to be mindful of is how availability fluctuates, you know? Like, man, as we were even um, doing this, this webinar, I, I get a message from a supervisee that says, I'm gonna need to move the supervision time, right? Like, you gotta update your schedules constantly. Like, if you weren't a tech person before, um, like you, you are going to become a tech, a tech person now and calendars updates. And I don't know how many calendars I share with people. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing with um, um, recognizing that things are going to come up. Things are going to come up before supervision. They're going to come up during supervision, after supervision. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it could be like we're in supervision for 10 minutes, but then all of a sudden some kids fell off a slide somewhere and now your supervisor, you have to go, you know? And so like, it doesn't matter where you are in that process, like things are gonna undoubtedly come up. And I, I think it's important to, so like right now, at Jude, as you said that I'm thinking, you know what, now would be a really good time for a fire drill in my office. <laughs> it would be perfect, right? Like this would be the perfect time for a fire drill, you know? But, but I think, you know, I think what's important about, about just that thought is, the 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 openness with which we communicate our availability to supervisees is paramount, right? Yeah. It, especially when you're in the middle of supervision and you're like, listen, I'm going to make this process very human. That there could be a chance that the fire alarm can go off, or you know, your babysitter might call. You know, so I want you to know that this supervision is important. But at the same time, there's also some things that could get in the way and, you know, figure out how to how to navigate that within the context of the relationship. Yeah. So that was the last point for flexibility. Um, so, so far, if you're, if you're following the agenda, we're looking at the big map. We've covered a situational awareness so far. We've covered um, being informed and we just finished covering flexibility. And so now we're going to move into probably one of the most humbling topics that we that, that we talked about uh, between ourselves multiple times is mm -hmm. um, technological savviness, you know? Um, we got four things to talk about in this little section, um, but man, this is such a humbling 
uh, part because I'm, I'm a millennial. I grew up with computers. I feel like I know the language, but there's so many different formats when we're, when we're working online now. There's, um, you know, uh, Canvas and Blackboard and all kinds of things. There's multiple platforms like Zoom and um, just all kinds of stuff. And so it, it helps, it helps me to kind of like have this, this board of like, what, what platforms am I using? What's the key things? I feel like an astronaut, like I need like a little cheat sheet for the different uh, platforms. Um, and then in addition to that, knowing uh, how to make those things encrypted, knowing which ones are HIPAA approved uh, for supervision, uh, just being mindful of all of those little things where you're using um, um, different formats and technology. I think, you know, not only knowing it, but knowing kind of what you don't know, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. like you know, and, I, and we'll cover that a little bit later, but, 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 you know, kind of paying attention to what you don't know and what others may not know that you know pretty well, you know? Yeah. So if you work in a faculty environment, you know, where it's pretty easy to assess, you know, to have access to other people. If you work in a clinical environment, you know, it's important to, to ask questions. You know, a lot of these practicum and internship courses use educational platforms, right? But it's, it's, it's varied. In any class, you could be using Canvas to communicate with your students as well as email to communicate with your students, as mm-hmm. well as your cell phone, as well as, you know, Zoom. And you can also bring in guest speakers using Zoom. I mean, it's, it's, it's so it's so varied and so technical, right? So so understanding that process is is important. Yeah, I mean you can have a laptop open, your iPad open, your cell phone open, two screens yeah. open. That's what I have right now. I, I, I <laughs> hopefully I don't burn out the power in New Orleans because I got you, my cell phone and my computer, and my other computer. <laughs> I felt like one point we should have mentioned was just get a surge protector. Yeah. <laughs> That's the first thing. Yeah, a surge protector in a in a backup generator. <laughs> Man, uh, so in addition to knowing what you don't know, you know that point that you raised, uh, Julius. Uh, man, be mindful of seeking out training. Right, like uh, check with the university resources. You know, at my university, we have an amazing person who's over all of the Canvas kind of technology things and we have a dean who who specializes in technology and she must have sent us a thousand emails over this time by right? just knowing like if you don't know something know someone who knows that thing right mm-hmm. um be able to to watch youtube videos and uh, uh, of walkthroughs of platforms like don't be embarrassed like don't be embarrassed say i just need to sit down and show me like and, and someone show me how to share or make groups in my Zoom, because I don't know how to do that, yep. you know? Yep. Or even on, you know, if let's say you're using Canvas, you know, how do you, how do you set up, uh, you know, discussion boards? You know, how do you, yeah. how do you upload a YouTube video to, you know, Blackboard or to Canvas, yeah. you know? Yeah. And little things like that, watching YouTube videos, like, you know, w- you know, with whatever free time you have is, is really important. Looking yeah. up CEU providers, you know, trying to, get the lay of the land of like, all right, who provides CEUs at an affordable cost, maybe even free, you know, how can I schedule these things out? I mean, really seeking out the training that's applicable to you in the moment, you know, because yeah. everyone's right now, at least I, the way I feel is everyone's trying to learn, you yeah. know, how to, how to yeah. function in, in this type of, uh, in this type of environment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the next thing, you know, in addition to seeking out trainings, in addition to seeking out resources, man, talk to the people around you. You know, that's something that I think we had to be mindful of was, you know, as a, as a therapist and proper practice, you can go, you know, you may share an office with, with uh, or suite with three or four other therapists and you're doing therapy all day and nobody talks to each other, mm-hmm. right? Like this is the time to reach, knock on the door, consult with people, right? Create yourself a contact list, you know, I have like a laminated sheet, like, you know, IT guy who can do this, you know, like this person could do that. If, you know, my computer explodes, this is the person I talk to, <laughs> you know, yeah. like creating those things. And then another flow chart for that. I feel like I'm painting the picture of my office is just full of charts and flow charts, yeah. uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> La- laminated flow chart. Uh-huh. Yeah. But, but in this time, it helps, you know, like, 
and creating that flow chart with your supervisees, you know, and being able to, to show them, hey, if, if our connection breaks up, if this falls flat, I'm going to do this first. I'm going to call you on this cell phone using this number, you know, and then if that doesn't work, I'm going to email you this. And if that doesn't work, I'm going to send you an owl, like anything, you know, to be able to get the student to feel comfortable and the supervisee to know what's going to happen next. But but even if you're not a flow chart person, right? Even if you're not that that you know technical with um, with the flow of how you communicate, it's also important to to don't change what works and to keep it simple. You know, so something as simple as listen, I'm really really good with you know doing supervision over the phone or via Zoom, yeah. but I'm not so good at this platform and that platform. So yeah. if anything happens, let's just reschedule for another time, yeah. you know, as opposed to going through the flow chart and, you know, doing all these things. It's important to keep it simple because that's what may work for you. And that that's what may be the least confusing. I feel like there was some secret shade on my flow charts, but. Hey, I mean, I mean you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so the last thing, right, we've covered, um, we, we've covered a, a a lot of different topics in this um, in this area, but I think it boils down to knowing how to troubleshoot, right? Knowing like uh, what to do when something happens, right? When the unspeakable happens, right? Being able to uh, test meetings with colleagues, right? Like setting up Zoom meetings or setting up different meetings and test your audio and, you know, like uh, uh, Judith and I, you know, before we do presentations like this, we we log on and we test the earphones. Like, can you hear me? Do I sound well? Like, what about the background? Does the lighting look good? Like being able to test things for colleagues, especially if you're going to record lectures or if you're going to record any kind of training. Um, and then you can also become instruct instructors in other people's course platforms if you're teaching internship or, and practicum, right? To be able to see their syllabi, to be able to see uh, resources that they give their supervisees, right? Like research articles or videos to watch. And so those things are knowing how to troubleshoot in that way, it, it's helpful. Uh, and I would even say, you know, it's important to engage the supervisees in the troubleshooting process, you know, mm -hmm. so, so have an open conversation about, all right, so, yeah. you know, what does troubleshooting look like for you? What are ways I can support you as we try to troubleshoot, you know, any, if it's a technical issue or if it's, you know, a, 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 you know, an issue with a client or an issue yeah. with, with the program, uh, you know, being open about that process really creates you know, this, this, this trust and this respect within the relationship, at least from my experience. Yeah. And so that's, that's the last point in technological savviness. Um, so, so far, again, we've covered situational awareness, we've covered uh, being informed, we've covered flexibility, and we just finished technological savviness with this uh, knowing how to troubleshoot, right? And that the next thing, and probably one of the most important things and something that we have to keep ourselves mindful of, is um, self-care and taking care of ourselves. Um, there's four things that we want to we want to address. Four things that we feel like are, are good to think about in this section. And the first one is um, that parallel trauma that everybody's experiencing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think Gia talked about it earlier when he says we have a, a common enemy now, which which brings people in supervision together. But there is this shared personal and professional experience, right? And and being human about that experience and talking through it, like, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling the same way. I man, I, you know, this, this is what's going on. For, I, di I didn't expect this to happen either. Being able to share with that, um, that experience is important. Yeah, it's important because it, it builds trust and it builds connection within the relationship. But, but there's also some empathy, right? There's some humanness to, to that experience when you start, you know, expressing some of the, you know, the parallels within the trauma. Um, I, I think, I mean, I, I think the hallmark of, of, you know, what we're trying to portray here is that the humanness to, to the relationship, you know, this, it's a shared experience. A lot of it is a shared experience, you know, so, so to, to, to share that, that personal and professional experience with your supervisees and with your colleagues is important. Yeah. Um, in addition to that shared experience and creating that empathy, Part of it is just being able to start identifying some of the emotions that your supervisees are going through, mm -hmm. right? Being mindful of 
what what they're going through and putting words to those struggles, right? Because because remember, like there's a butterfly effect that's happening, right? Like like we're going through this as supervisees, as, as supervisors, they're going through it as supervisees, and then their clients are going through it as clients, and so you have this kind of butterfly effect. Like the things that affect me as a supervisor is definitely going to affect the client, right? And so um, being able to share things like survivor's guilt and talk through that and fear and anxiety and talk through that. Like, what does that mean, you know, in supervision? Because what you say may give a student an idea of what they can say in, in session. Mm -hmm. I, and I think one of the words that, that weighs really heavy on this slide is the perfectionism. You know, I, I know it's been my experience just as a student, but also as a professor, that most students struggle with the, you know, with the perfectionism. And it's very hard to be uh, perfect in an unpredictable um, time, right? So, so students may struggle with, you know, not feeling adequate or maybe feeling like an imposter or maybe even dealing with disappointment. You know, the, the, the notions that they disappointed you in some way or that they disappointed themselves, you know, with the yeah. Yeah, you, you have students who may look at you as ultra professional, and then this time they are just struggling to keep it together. And so they show up to supervision in a three piece suit, knowing, you know, that like they don't feel like a three piece suit um, right. right now. You yeah. know? Um, and so, in addition to that, you know, that in addition to processing those emotions and building the empathy, um, one of the ideas that we talked about was trying to make, trying to view supervision as self care, right? Because, um, like we, we like to think of it as like this, this life layover, like this time where you come into supervision and the supervisee has a time to just regroup and reprocess, maybe to get some information because you've created an iterative process mm -hmm. and they could just sit and feel like supervision is taking care of them, right? And so taking care of the students doing supervision is important because that can be viewed as a source of self-care, right? A place to regroup, a place to sit there and kind of recollect yourself. I mean, the thing that comes to mind for me when you're talking, Jude, is, you know, taking that deep breath, you know, walking into, you know, supervision, you know, uh, logging into supervision and knowing that, all right, this is a place where I can regroup, you know, I can, I can, I can you know, kind of ease the tension, reorganize my mind on okay who, who, what clients am I seeing what am I experiencing what am I focusing on where is the tension in my body um, mm -hmm. things like that it's important to 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 you know to care for yourself in that way you know and, and also developing game plans you know so okay I'm I you know I feel jittery or I feel rushed or I feel like I'm paying too much attention to the time in session you know okay so how can we develop a game plan and you know, what does that look like um, that's all methods of, of caring for the self. And then broadly speaking, you know, is developing a self-care plan for ourselves as supervisors and also helping students to develop a self-care plan now, like in this, in this time particularly, you know, like getting supervisees and ourselves to pay attention to what we need at this time. You know, that's oftentimes the way I start a supervision session. It's just by saying, all right, what do you need today? You know, like what do you need today? Um, and then narrowing down the options, right, of those needs or, or how you're going to accomplish those needs into a specific goal. You know, like somebody's goal may be like, I just want to eat lunch at noon, you know, instead of like eating lunch at 4 p.m., you know, um, like just being able to assess those resources and, and, and have this general kind of overview of, right, like what's going on for me as a supervisor? What's going on for my supervisee? And how can we work to develop a plan to where we're taking care of ourselves so that we can be the best supervisor and the best clinician for our clients? And, and even looking at the title, right, developing a self-care plan may cause some anxiety. I know it yeah. definitely causes anxiety yeah. for me because... It's something else I, to fail at. <laughs> listen, I, I, <laughs> for real, I, I follow plans, but, but when you add the word self-care in front of the word plan, yeah, it's real tough to follow a plan, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, so even within the context of the relationship, exploring and kind of being accountable for the tension, the anxiety around the word, you know, self-care, and then the word plan, you know, that stuff is important to broach, 
you know, within the, within the, the conversation and check in, you know, check in with the self, you know, okay, what's my plan? How am I feeling? You know, and modify goals if necessary. Yeah, absolutely. And so that was the last point <clears throat> on self-care. And so just as a review, just to kind of review some of the things we talked about, because I know there was a lot, um, we started off by talking about increasing your situational awareness, right? Being able to, to sit there and gain a different perspective, right? Also uh, working towards being more informed, right? Creating that flow chart, if that's your thing, like it's my thing, right? But just finding some way uh, for you to know what's going on, right? To help the students answer the questions that they may not know that they need to ask. Right. Um, and then we moved into improving your flexibility um, and comfort with the unknown. Right. Like we it's, it's a process. And we know that when the first thing we tell students or the first thing we tell our supervisee who's entering into the profession is you got to be comfortable with ambiguity. You know, and you, you have that phrase. It depends. That should probably make a bunch of y'all cringe right now. You know, <laughs> um, but to be able to improve that flexibility and then building your technological savviness, right? Like starting to familiarize yourself with the technology around you because that's kind of the, your tools now, you know? Um, that's gonna be your tools. And then the last thing and probably one of the most important things is actually doing all of that, make sure you're taking care of yourself, right? Making sure that you're staying healthy um, and staying on top of what you need to do to be able to support the supervisees that, um, that we're taking care of. I think that's it. I think that's the last thing. I think now we're going to take some questions, right? Yeah. Hi, this is Lee Monville from Springer Publishing. Uh, thank you, Jude and Julius. That was excellent. Uh, we really appreciate it. We did get some questions from the audience. So um, I'm going to start with the first question we got was, how are emulation activities that can count as direct care for practitioners, interns, as defined by KCREP? What was the question again? How are emulation activities that can count as direct care for pract practitioners, interns defined by KCREP? Ah, uh, yeah, if, if I'm understanding the question right, it, it sounds like that it sounds like the person is really asking, like, what can be counted as direct hours for students, you know? Right. And, um, Chris, and it came from Chris. And if Chris, if you want to follow up, you can shoot me a note on the chat, too. Thanks. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I know I know for us, like in, in our program, like one of the things that we've checked in with KCREP about is the idea of role plays and if role plays can count as direct hours. And from what from what I know right now, it it seemed like it couldn't. It seemed like KCREP is pretty firm on, you know, we want the, the students to be able to have and the supervisees to be able to have direct contact with a client right and so that can be you know um via video or in a tele any telehealth um, um approach but that's the only thing that that to, to my knowledge that they're accepting okay yeah chris followed up and said how is emulation defined uh, oh gosh I don't, I don't know i would have to look into like mm -hmm. the, the, the the catalogs of of k crep um well, we can follow up with Chris separately. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. cool. Um, so Daniel asked the following, COVID-19 has certainly changed counseling education and supervision. What are your mm. thoughts on the current racial situation in light of counseling education and uh, supervision? Supervising people of color, interns working with clients of color, discussing hashtag Black Lives Matter, hashtag racism, hashtag white privilege, et cetera. Hashtag, hashtag. <laughs> How do we know this question will come up, Jesus? Oh, I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know. Because it's, it's, it's not surprising. You know, it's, it's funny. And Jesus, I don't mind. If you don't mind, I, I like to take at least start off a little bit, yeah, yeah, you cool. know, with like, man, I'm teaching diversity this summer. Mm -hmm. you know, what a time to teach diversity. Um, to keep the answer brief, you know, I think, I think um, you know, they talk about the idea of broaching you know, like broaching that multicultural conversation in supervision and, and sessions, this is that time to broach it. You almost have like a built-in segue, you mm -hmm. know, because a lot of the students are themselves facing that. And so um, 
you know, to, there is no one way to do it, but I feel like now is the chance, it's the time to do it and have those tough conversations um, um, with, with supervisees. So I know for myself, we talk about that. We, I know my supervisees, especially if we're doing cross-cultural supervision, are asking me questions that I'm like, man, I don't know if I can answer that right now. I don't even know if I understand, you know, how I'm feeling right now. Mm-hmm. So to kind of to kind of go off of, of what you're saying, I think it's important to realize like, yeah, or, so yeah, like broach it, right? But also understand that there's a lot of things that's happening within the context of that relationship, right? So that there's, there's what's going on with you and the media that you're consuming and your own mm-hmm. feelings and thoughts and your own emotions that's wrapped up within the situation. And likewise for the supervisee, right? There's all their thoughts and the things that they bring into it. And then there's this in between, right? It's how, you know, what you're experiencing and what the student's experiencing and how that influenced you guys' relationship. Mm-hmm. I think what's important is that there's some openness and some honesty within that conversation. From, from my experience, at least the way that I approach it, like it's not really a time, and I don't think I have that privilege as an African-American male to, you know, not be honest and not be steadfast with not only my beliefs, but the way I communicate those beliefs to students. Because I feel like man, as an African-American male, the, the questions kind of come at me, and this is just my experience within the classroom, the questions kind of come at me and it's very important to not take it as, oh, let me just speak for my race, you know? Yeah. Um, but but more so to, okay, how can I convey not only my thoughts and my feelings, but also model communicating my thoughts and my feelings within a clinical setting? Because mm-hmm. if it's gonna happen in supervision, those tough conversations are gonna happen in session too. Mm-hmm. And so while it's important to have those conversations, it's also important to train students and supervisees on also how to have those conversations with their clients. Mm -hmm. Well, another question we got was, where is the best place to find information about acceptable encryption services used for supervision supervision sessions? Google. No, I'm I'm kidding. No, I, I, I'll, I'll share what, what I did. You know, I, um, I looked into the, like the ACA code of ethics and then, and then I, the best place for me was just calling the board. Like I just called that the board because I am in Texas right now. So I just called the board and say, okay, what are, what are my options as far as, um, as far as technological yep. services, right? And checking in with colleagues as well to see, you use that as that tip or approved? Where's the, the, the data on that? You know? and, and so, and then you kind of add to that, I, I'm, at a, I'm, in, I'm at Tulane University. So, I mean, there's a, the IIT um, person's office is three or four doors down, you know? So, I mean, we see each other getting coffee, you know? So it's, it, it's important to go to people who know more than you in that aspect and say like, listen, this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to understand a software that will fit these specific needs, but that's yeah. that's also, you know, HIPAA approved. That is also in, in encrypted. Um, yeah, I think that I think you know those are those are surefire way of getting at least a starting point on the answers yep. you need. That's yeah, right. and some yeah some continuing education platforms can also provide resources mm-hmm. for that as well. One of the questions we had in our chat from Justin was regarding the decision-making flow chart, would you be willing to share this? No, oh, that's wonderful. proprietary. That is proprietary. <laughs> <laughs> no. I don't no. even know if y'all want that. Like, no. <laughs> <laughs> are you sure y'all want that in your in y'all's life? Yeah, no, I, I absolutely, I absolutely don't mind sharing it. I mean, it may be anticlimactic, you know, talking about it because it's not, it's not like a hundred things. But, sure. Um, but yeah, I, w- I would be more than happy to share it. So we can we can coordinate that with you and follow up with folks who have attended today. Yeah. We have um, two more things, two more quick things. One was, how have you two been maintaining your self care in a time when a lot of um, people of color supervisors are mourning and still needing to work and care for supervisees? 
in the COVID era? Man. Do you want to go first? Yeah. No, why don't, why don't you go ahead? So, so do you, I mean, you and I were kind of talking about this the other day. Sometimes it can feel like conversations, whether you're a clinician or a supervisor, um, is repetitive, you know, even, even so, so yeah, right. The conversations are repetitive, but even from your colleagues, you know, the repetitive emails of, Hey, how are you doing? I'm just checking in, you yeah. know, and you're like, Oh, I'm doing fine. It's really sunny outside. And I, Oh, that's not what you mean. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Um, you know, it's, it can be repetitive and kind of, kind of daunting, you know? So the way I, the way I take care of myself is, and I'm gonna limit the the media I consume, you know. Mm-hmm. So I, I, you know, try to stay away from social media. I mean, I'm I'm on social media, but I also try to resist the urge to comment on on certain things, you know, because because I mean, you know, it's a fact that you know, you you know, we have, some of us have you know advanced licensure and you know have voices and what we say mean things, you know. So it's important yeah. to understand our impact, you know. Another thing is, you know, going to the gym, you know, going yeah. going to CrossFit and, and really, um, really setting out a time to be intentional with being connected to my heart. Sometimes I feel like it's going to explode. So there's no other thing <laughs> during the gym time that I can pay attention to except for my heart and keeping, my love. Keeping yourself alive. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But I think, but I think even, even in that experience, you know, there's some, some importance to blocking out, you know, emotions and really focusing on the self. Yeah. I think the, the only thing I would add, you know, is I, I try sometimes to communicate with people who aren't therapists, you know, because, um, I, I mean, I'm a therapist. I love therapists. But sometimes, man, you can be in a room full of therapists and there's just so much emotional, like, uh, caring and humility and sharing. And it could it could even be overwhelming. So sometimes I just I talk to, you know, my friends who aren't therapists and try to get their perspective and, you know, and maybe somebody who, who won't um, empathize with me or somebody who won't, um, you know, sympathize with me, but who just won't talk about anything, but just you know, did I get the all change and, and how was that like, you know? And just real quick, like real quick, I mean, it goes without saying, but like time with family, you know, time with kids, yeah. just being in the moment and watching my kids play in the sand at the house or yeah. watching my son ride his bike or, you know, give him, you know, giving my kids a bath or, yeah. you know, uh, but, but, you know, watching a movie that me and my wife wanted to watch, you know, we got to fight the kids to go to sleep so we can watch it. Like, you know, being intentional about the time that, that we use. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Thank you both for um, answering these questions. We have a couple more questions, so we'll try and answer those offline because we're almost okay. at the end of our time. We did want to let folks who are attending today know that we are offering a special discount off of Jude and Julius's book. So the information is in the presentation now. Um, please go to the link that's provided there. Um, or come to springerpub.com slash the counselor educators guide and you can enter that code and get 25% off of their book and uh, if you have any other questions about their book please feel free to reach out to us at Springer. And now I'll turn it back to my colleague Rhonda. Thanks Lee. Thanks everyone. Thanks uh, Drs. Austin. Really appreciate it. I, it was very uh, informative and humorous. We saw a lot of folks laughing out loud in the chat. Um, and I want to reiterate that in seven to 10 days, uh, everyone will have access to this recorded presentation and the information about the discount will be there. Uh, you can go to our website and take advantage of that discount code whenever you uh, are, in, are uh, able to. And I want to thank our internal folks today, uh, Gina Martinez for making this happen, Erica Bloom as well, and Lee uh, for Montville for his time and putting this all together, and of course, uh, Doctors Austin. So thanks everyone for your time. We hope you got a lot out of it and uh, we'll, we'll uh, be available to you if you have any questions about our products, 
Um, anything that we do here as far as counseling education, um, uh, you can contact me at rdearborn at springerpub.com. And uh, thank you again and have a great and safe rest of your afternoon.